Hey guys, my guest for you today is somebody that paid off $225,000 in student loans in less than 20 three months. Imagine if you are in a situation where you're experiencing debt, where you have no idea how to pay off your student loans or even just like debt in general, and you don't have any possible idea of how you could actually get out there. This is the conversation that I wish I had when I started accumulating a lot of debt from dumb decisions that I made in the past. Um, we talk about so many things in this interview. You know, uh, my guest for you is Erica Kuhlberg, who built a huge YouTube channel uh, talking about personal finance. She used to be a lawyer, left lawyershipness to start her online business to help local businesses and businesses in general uh, with legal advice on a more affordable level. And she's somebody that I really look to when it comes to personal finance advice. I learned a lot of things from her and I'm super grateful that she hopped on. Um, if you wanna know more, a lot of her links are in the descriptions from her website to her YouTube channel. But with that being said, guys, this was an amazing conversation. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys did too. With that being said, I'll see you guys in the show intro. Hi. Hey. How are you? Good. Long time no see. <laughs> Long time no see. How have you been? Good. How's your week been? Uh, pretty good. Um, did a lot of work. Uh, but other than that, I mean, there's really not much we could do here. It's actually yeah. not that bad here in Bali, though. What's it like in? You're in Japan. Yeah, it's it's getting a bit worse, but I mean, everyone's wearing masks, so it's about as contained as can be, I guess. Mm. Yeah, Bali's kind of weird. Everyone is is kind of like really taking it seriously, but also kind of half-assing it. Like everyone still goes to the beach and everyone still goes to the gym. And I don't think we've gotten hit that bad. I, don't, I haven't heard of really any cases. So everyone's just kind of doing their regular life, but with yeah. just added caution. That's good. That's yeah. really good to hear. <laughs> how did you, how did you actually end up in Japan? Cause that was like the thing that kind of surprised me. Um, I actually heard about you from my sister. Uh, Cause uh, one thing that's going on with our business is like, for some reason, like we're just attracting a bunch of women ages 18 to 54 as like my core audience, like out of nowhere, right? And I think you fit ages 18 yeah, to 54. Me. <laughs> I mean, you're Asian though, so you could either be 18 or 54. Right? Yeah, I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> um, and then she told me about you and she was like, yeah, you know, like we, we need to start interviewing like women that can empower other women. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Like I could just be, I guess, the Matthew Hussey of business then, I guess, or something. Um, and she was like looking at all of these people that she was following and she was like following you and she saw that you blew up. I was like, yeah, let's get her on. She has like a cool story. We could introduce her to like the community that's coming in from our Facebook ads because in all honesty, like my old audience was just males 18 to 24. And I was like, I don't know how to like talk to all these women, 18 <laughs> to 54. It's such a broad spectrum. Um, so we got you on, uh, she told me about you, saw some of your videos and uh, we scheduled it. And then I saw it said Japan. And I was like, what? How did that yeah. happen? Wait, so first of all, I love your sister. What's her name? My sister's Angelique. She does all of our like Facebook ads and social media management. Ooh, well, thank yeah. you, Angelique. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's actually really um, cool. For... What's that? Uh, I was just going to say, she's kind of like, I think the the person that pulls all the strings in the back end. Because now she's like trying to take me from my old brand, which is like this kid traveling around the world with a red bandana um, to just, I think more mainstream. Like I said, she says Matthew Hussey mixed with like business advice. And I was like, man, that's going to be kind of, I think, interesting <laughs> to see how it plays out. I love it. I love your sister already. <laughs> um, for Japan. So long story short, I'm half Japanese. My mom is Japanese. My dad's American mm -hmm. U.S. Air Force. So he was stationed in Japan and then met my mom. And so I spent probably around half my childhood living in Japan, wow. just going to military schools on these bases. And so when I went to college in the States and then law school in the States, I always dreamt of coming back to live in Japan. And sure enough, 
an opportunity came for this mega law firm here. Mm. So I jumped on it and that's how I ended up in Tokyo. And now, even though I don't work for the law firm anymore, I'm working for my own company. Mm. Um, I still want to stick around here because I love it so much. Mm. What was it like um, going to college, studying to become a lawyer? I know like part of your story and then you go to the other side of the world and then out of nowhere, you stop doing your job and you start going into uh, business for yourself. Was there like a transition period or were you just like one day, you know, I saved enough, I paid off that. Now it's time to do my own thing. Yeah, there was, there was basically no transition period because I had been plotting it for so long. Like I had basically <laughs> had it one. The scenes. <laughs> yeah, no, I had, like, I was I like at my own here. law firm just, like, <laughs> plotting it for months and months, like almost a year of just after I paid off my student loans, just mm. saving up and trying to build this cushion because obviously the best thing about the hardest thing about entrepreneurship is not having the funding to pursue what you want. So then a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, you have to, it's, it's really hard to support yourself. So I mm -hmm. knew that before I made the leap to go work for myself and quit the law firm, I wanted to save up enough money to be able to do it comfortably where, you know, now I have enough saved up that maybe if my business goes nowhere, maybe in a year or so, I have to go back to these law firms and like beg for a job. Mm. But, but right now it's nice because with these savings, I'm allowed to take these risks and allowed to try to do my best building the YouTube channel and building the online legal business. So mm. that's really where it came from. I plotted it for a long time, just lived very frugally, lived below my means and mm. then made the jump. How did you, I'm, I'm always curious on how people like make that transition because I feel like if we could reverse engineer it, then it's it's almost like this thing that we could just start giving to people and be like, hey, you don't actually have to do this thing. There's there's like all these other things that you could do online. Um, how did you think of your business idea was when you were like plotting behind the scenes of trying to just get out? Was it easy? Were you modeling somebody else's or was it something that uh, you saw a need in the marketplace and you're like, oh man, this is a great idea. I don't see anyone else doing it. What was like kind of your situation? No, that's a really good question. So my whole thing is right now I've, after spending so many years as a lawyer at this law firm, I realized that lawyers basically overcharge for a lot of things. Mm. I'm sure this is like common knowledge to the public, but being on the other side, like being at this law firm and charging, I don't know, hundreds of dollars an hour. I was like, this is not efficient. And what I really want to be doing is helping small business owners and entrepreneurs, not these large corporations. But the problem for small business owners, I realized, is they really only have, let's say you need a privacy policy for your website. You only have two choices, really. You can get one for free online, which the free stuff is not good. It doesn't protect you. Or you can pay a lawyer like a couple thousand dollars to draft one for you. There was no in between. So I saw that problem that there's this huge gap between mm. paying top dollar for a lawyer to do something for you and getting something for free that's not going to legally protect you. And I just wanted to come right in between and try to fill this gap where I could provide these legal templates for entrepreneurs and online business owners at an affordable cost, but that's top quality, like that yeah. a top law firm would draft for you, but you just pay like a tenth of what you'd pay a lawyer. So. Mm that's the need I saw. And that's when I really decided like, this is going to be my life mission. Like I want to basically make the legal stuff affordable for people because it's not, it's ridiculous that you only have those two extremes. Mm. Yeah. That's like one thing that I hear um, with all my friends that uh, get into any legal issues is like the only real winners they say are, are just the lawyers and the attorneys. Um, Cause they just like bleed people out of like all their money. What well, what's the difference between actually like a lawyer and an attorney? Is it it's, it's like same different? thing? It's just it's a the different same word. Thing? I mean, okay. I think attorney sounds more like more proper. Yeah, but it's the same thing. And then when you when you first started, were you like, oh, I'm just gonna go all in on YouTube, or were you gonna try blogging? Like, how did you find YouTube as like your fit? Because I think you're blowing up. You're at, what is it? 60, 70, 80 thousand followers. <laughs> Something like so, that. <laughs> Yeah, it's like yeah, it's it's really grown. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do because I had spent like almost a decade of my life doing law stuff, like college with the intention of law school, yeah. law with the intention of law school, or law school with the intention of law. Um, 
I wanted to do something that was completely unrelated to law. I knew I was going to have this legal business, which by the way, is called plug in law. Mm. I was going to have this legal business, but I wanted to do something just for my own sanity to do something completely unrelated to law. Yeah. And for me, I realized you, you kind of figure out what you're good at by the questions your friends ask you. Yeah. So my friends were always asking me for financial advice. They were saying like, you know, how, how do I pay off my student loans? What credit card should I get? And that's something I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed mm. talking about personal finance. And obviously personal finance changed my life. I mean, if there are many people who make these high salaries, but just spend it all. Had I done that same mm. thing and gone on that same trajectory of spending the amount that I was making, there's no way I would have been able to leave the law firm and do what I'm doing now, which is the best job in the world. Mm. And so because of that, like I love personal finance so much. I love the idea of helping people get their finances together. So I was like, okay, my non-law thing is going to be personal finance. I'm going to teach mm. people about personal finance. And then of course I went through the, probably the, uh, crossroads that everyone goes through when they're deciding to go into the online space is, oh, should I do a blog or should I do a YouTube channel? Should I do a podcast? Should I do and, everything? Yeah. Should I do everything? Yeah. First of all, don't do everything. That's <laughs> a quick way to burn out. I know. I um, try doing everything and it sucks. <laughs> I know. Don't do it. You got you to yeah. focus on one thing. But I, I kind of, I'm a writer. So yeah. that's what lawyers do. I'm a corporate lawyer. That's, I love writing. I love being behind a computer. That's what's very comfortable to me. And so the natural comfortable route would have been a blog, but I also am going through this phase where it's like, I want to challenge myself. I'm so tired of letting fear stop me. And like, I'm so afraid of the judge. I used to be mm. so afraid of people judging me that I would never do things because of it. And so I was like, let me do something crazy. Let me, even though writing and a blog would be more comfortable, let me do YouTube. Mm. I don't know how to talk to a camera. I don't know the first thing about YouTube. I don't even watch YouTube, but let me try it. So, mm. so that's how it started. Yeah, no, I, I definitely resonate with uh, what you're talking about personal finance, because I remember, um, I think when I was, when I first started making some money online, I was uh, around a bunch of people where, you know, we all just wanted to kind of like buy things we didn't need to impress people we didn't like, like what Tony Robbins talks about. And, you know, I saw my friends like getting nicer cars and then uh, like from apartments to homes and then just like spending more and more. And there was like this thing inside of me where it almost felt like insignificant or insecure unless I bought something to just keep up. Right. And like, I remember there was a moment where like I had to make, made a decision I could have either like moved into like this really nice place in Chicago where I'm mm -hmm. from or I could just buy a one-way ticket to the other side of the world and just like figure it out and I'm so happy and glad that I think I was like 21 or 22 I got a one-way trip ticket to Thailand and like everyone's like where the hell did you go and I was like I don't know and, and it was so good because you know for like the longest time I was only spending just maybe like $10 a day. And then my apartment was like $200 a month. And I was able to just aggressively save uh, for the future and not fall into the trap of just trying to buy things. Cause I felt like if I stayed back in the States, man, I, I, I wouldn't have made probably the smartest decisions cause I'm not the smartest person. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that you are. <laughs> No, it's so, it's so true. I mean, we live in this world where people want instant gratification. Yeah. Buying the latest purse is going to make you happy in that moment. But what it's going to do is keep you down in the long term because, because you spent a thousand dollars on that purse, you're not going to have a thousand dollars to invest in your future to live comfortably when you're older. Yeah. So it's the, it's the hardest thing, right? Resisting this temptation of keeping up with the Joneses and trying to impress your friends. Mm. I can't like, I was definitely like that in my early 20s too. I was buying new shoes that I thought would make me look cooler. And now I just don't care. Like on, on YouTube, people complain about my shirts because I wear the same white, five white shirts, but mm. that's my life. Like I like to keep it simple. I don't really care about impressing people. Mm. I wear the same Walmart shoes I bought five years ago. Um, it's, it's different, right? When you switch your mentality to... No, I don't care about instant gratification. I don't care about impressing people who I honestly don't care about. I care about 
creating a future for myself that mm. will allow me to be financially free one day. Mm. It, it gets even extreme, like the less developed countries you go to. That's what I found. Like the more less developed countries I live in, the more extreme I could go in minimalism. Like, so for example, right now I'm in uh, Bali and it's like cool because for example, like everything here is just like really cheap. And then because we're by the beach, no one really even wears shoes. Um, we all just wear swimming trunks and <laughs> I maybe have like a couple t-shirts. Um, but it, it's like just so interesting because I remember like, isn't it weird when you look back how when it comes to, you know, trying to save money, trying to make money, there's still this kind of voice in the back of your mind where you're like, wow, she, like she got that, he got that. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need to spend. Right. And before they know it, they're like in this trap of never actually getting out of debt, which you were able to do. They would never pay off the student loan debt because they're worried more about how they may be perceived as other people. But I think n none of them actually really know that no one's actually judging them because everyone else is in their own head judging themselves on comparing themselves to others. So it's like, I think when you leave and I'm not sure what your situation was, cause I, like you were already in Japan when you were there and then you kind of like experienced the American culture. But what was, what was that experience like comparing the two when you were in the States to then when you were able to leave and then you were able to just see on a higher level how you could actually pay off your debt because you paid off what was it like two hundred and fifty three thousand in like twenty four months or twelve months? <laughs> yeah, I think two hundred twenty five thousand. Two hundred twenty five. I'm trying to think of like the clickbait for this video. She paid <laughs> two hundred and twenty five. Two twenty five. Two twenty five months in twenty three months. <laughs> There's your title. <laughs> oh, that's so good for Pinterest. That's like a good <laughs> Pinterest title. I feel like. Oh, awesome! I don't know Pinterest, but that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, well, it's weird because Japan, when I moved here, I was working at an American law firm. So you're very much in this bubble. It felt like just working at a New York law firm. Mm. So it didn't really feel that different. But I think my mentality, I think the biggest tip I have for students who want to pay off their student loan debt is to never allow yourself to think that you're not still a broke student. Because as soon as you leave that mentality of broke student, it's very hard to come back down. There's this thing called lifestyle inflation, where as your salary increases, you, you inflate your lifestyle. You start to do the Uber rides. You start to get takeout. And the easiest way to combat lifestyle inflation is to just never leave the mentality of, oh, I'm a broke student. I don't have any money to spend. So even though I was making this big law firm salary, I still live just like I did as a student and I never left that mentality. Mm. And only after I paid off the debt did I treat myself to like a massage once in a while. <laughs> and then what was kind of that experience? So you, you left college. Um, when did it actually hit you that you were like, wow, I actually have to pay this back pretty soon. Was it pretty uh, soon or did you kind of like push it off? You sounded like pretty responsible. It didn't hit me for maybe five months after I graduated from law school. Mm -hmm. So I started getting all of these letters in the mail saying like forbearance and grace period. And I just had no idea what those words meant. <laughs> so I had this moment of panic where I was like, oh my gosh, I took out $200,000 of debt. I've never seen $200,000 in my life. Like I didn't realize the gravity of it until I got these letters and realized I have no clue what they're talking about. So that week, I remember being on Reddit, probably like 60 hours, just researching everything like student loans, how to pay off, refinance. And that's the moment where I decided like, I need to get this in control. I'm no longer a student. I can't just think of it as monopoly money. This is real life money that's going to be due very soon. And I need to get it under control. So that's when I set out and calculated that I could pay it off in two years if I lived frugally as a student. So mm. what, what was that uh, monthly payment? Like with, with 200,000, how did you calculate what you needed to pay on a monthly basis so that in two years it could actually be fully paid off for? Yeah, so I just did a rough estimation. There are calculators out there. I think Student Loan Hero has a calculator that'll help you do it better. But I did a rough estimation. I think I needed to pay somewhere around 9,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And it required refinancing my loans because my loans, the average interest rate was around 6.8%, which at that rate, you're just 
paying interest, right? Mm. Interest is going to eat up any money you put towards it. So one of the first things I did was refinance my loans to get them down to around 3%. Mm. So with that factored in, I figured it was about 9,000 a month. Mm. And some months I did more, some months I did less. It really depended. Like if I had a medical emergency and I had to pay more that, or I didn't have as much money to put towards loans that month, then over the like next three or four months, I would pay just a little more so that I could stay on track. Mm. Do you think if you could do it all over again, um, knowing what you know now and uh, experiencing what you're experiencing now, do you think you would actually go back and if like, if I could just press this button on like the bottom of this like left screen and you were just like teleported back into, uh, you know, meeting the 18 year old version of yourself and she has like this big dreams of, oh, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to get like $200,000, $225,000 of debt. And this is going to be beautiful. And um, knowing what you know now and the decision that you made, if you still ended up learning the same knowledge that you did just from various other means like the internet or reddit or whatever instead of actually going to um the typical college university would you what like what would you tell that younger version of yourself and would you even tell that person to go to college or would you tell them to do something else and just like go to like reddit university and just <laughs> ask reddit questions and figure it out through using reddit that's really, really a good question. I think, and actually, so just yesterday I was, I had someone asked me the same question. Yeah. There is a 17 year old boy on YouTube. His name is Will and he runs this channel called the Financial Wolf and he's just killing it. Like he's, his channel has grown so much. He's so smart, so entrepreneurial for his age, but he was saying that his parents are encouraging him to go to college. So he wanted to know what, what we thought. And I think the best advice I have for this is no college isn't necessary for everyone. Yes, it does have perks. One of the big things that you pay for when you go to college is the value of the network. You can always, so for me, I went to college at Notre Dame. So I'm always going to be plugged into the Notre Dame network. It's a very strong alumni network. That's part of what you pay tuition for. I think it's just not necessary for everyone. And I think if I could go back to my 18 year old self, I would say that don't just think you have to do a certain thing because that's the right course. Because as high school Americans, we're funneled into college. We're yeah. essentially told that it's either college or I went to military school. So yeah. it was either college or the military. Those were your really only two choices. And I wish I had told myself to just think about it a little more. Even law school, I don't think I, don't think I necessarily wanted to be a lawyer. I really wanted to be a doctor. But mm. I did poorly in organic chemistry. So I was like, okay, well, I'm an Asian child. What do I have? My choices are a doctor or lawyer. Or so disowned. doctor, I'm not smart enough. Let's do the law thing. So yeah. that's how it happened, right? You, you feel like you have to go on this path because that's what society tells you. So to my 18-year-old self, I would just say to think a little more about it. Reach out to the people who, think, who you think have your dream job. So mm. if my dream job was to work on Wall Street, I would reach out to those people now at 18 years old and say, hey, can I shadow you for a day? Hey, can I interview you and, t and see what it's really like to do your job? Instead of working so many years and paying thousands of dollars towards a job that you think is your dream job, but it might not be your dream job because that's what I fell into, right? Mm. I, I spent $200,000 on law school, spent three years in law school, four years in college to get to this dream job as a corporate lawyer at the top law firm in the world. And then once I got there, I was this high paid lawyer straight out of suits and I realized it was not the dream job. Mm. So had I taken a step back and thought about it a little, a little more and realized that it's not the only choice and it's not the only path and put some more time into actually investing and in, in figuring out if it is the right job, I might've made a different decision. So mm. that's my advice for 18 year old Erica. <laughs> Yeah, it's like so weird because I remember when I was like 13, it was like I had to decide what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And you're, you're just kind of like blindly going through it because, you know, as like with Asian parents, you're either a doctor, dentist, lawyer, nurse, or you're just completely disowned and they don't feed you anymore, you know? Not like just a, <laughs> like on a more extreme level. Yeah. Like I, I kid, but I, I think that's serious in some cases. Um, so it was actually like, 
really hard, you know, it, it, like, I feel like people could hear that advice um, and be like, oh yeah, you know, that's great. But there's always like this over looming, we know best thing from your parents uh, just because they were raised in a different time period, right? Where maybe, you know, especially if they're immigrants, they're, 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 that's that's like their American dream. They're like, okay, this yeah. is, you're going to get so much more for us. You're going to have a better, you're going to be able to raise your kids better than we could ever provide for you with a college education. And I think, you know, the, 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 that's like amazing advice, but then there's like this overlooming thing of people's parents. Like, how would you then tell 18 year old Erica what to do. Cause if you told her that, and then, you know, Asian mom or Asian dad, uh, like my Asian mom would be like, no, 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 you, you stay, you stay in college or else, you know, I won't love you or just some shit like that. Uh, how would you kind of balance that out? Because you have like this really good advice and then you have, you know, just the status quo of how you should act because that's how your friends act. And that's how your parents want you to act. And that's how you want your family to act. And, and you're 18, right? So you care about what everybody thinks instead of really focusing on that voice inside your head on what you actually want, you know? Yeah. It's really hard for me to give advice on that because I didn't do that. I felt so much pressure yeah. from my parents to, I did want to make them proud and I didn't want to disappoint them because I knew like the sacrifices they made and it was their dream to have a daughter go to college in the US. So I very much felt like I owed them this, I owed it to them to make them proud and make make all of their sacrifices worth it. So that's just a really hard question. I don't know how to answer. I don't have advice. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. What what is what what are your parents what did your parents think when you left the law firm to do your own stuff and then start making like YouTube videos. Cause I feel like for that generation, they're like what you're doing, like, like I was supposed to be a dentist. Right. So I, I did the exact same thing, but for dental stuff. And then I left my first year of dental school. So right when my mom was just like, Oh, you know, to all of like the aunties and gr like grandmas where you're basically just bragging that your kid is better <laughs> than all of your other, you know, sisters, kids, you know, Oh, you know, my son is going to be a dentist. So uh, he's better than your son, but you know, I still love your son. And then out of nowhere, I just literally, like if I was my mom and I just experienced what she experienced where I was just like, Oh yeah, mom, I quit. And then I just like left. And then they just started seeing like my Instagram pictures starting to like up level. Like, I think my aunt still thinks, you know, I might be a drug dealer or something. Like she doesn't understand like making videos or content or running sales funnels to offers or Facebook ads is an actual thing, you know? So, so I'm curious what your parents thought when you kind of left this, oh, you know, my daughter had the, worked in the number one law firm in the world mm -hmm. to now she's making videos and has this thing online where she writes articles. Like I, I wouldn't be able to comprehend it if I was wearing my mom's hat right now. I know. I know. I was really surprised because I remember having that conversation with my parents and telling them that I was going to be leaving the law firm. Mm. And I just thought there would be so much disappointment. I thought, I thought, yeah, I thought they were going to be so disappointed and discourage me from doing it. But actually they surprised me. They, they were very supportive. And I think, I think because in part, I went through with everything and I got to the top of the legal profession. I think there's less of a what if. Like, mm. I think if I had quit during law school, it would have been a completely different conversation. But because I went through and still did the thing, and then after achieving that big feat, realized it wasn't for me, they were just surprisingly supportive. And the YouTube thing is so funny. If you look at my first videos, Yoko is my mom's name. She was commenting on all of my first videos. So, Yoko. <laughs> and she, even to this day, like when I go visit her, I'll go downstairs and just hear my voice in the background. I'm like, mom, what are you doing? She's like, oh, this is how I uh, help you with your ad revenue. I just uh, leave it on, on go on my uh. iPhone. <laughs> It's and so now, when, now when she she has the the same conversations that your mom has mm. she has those too and i'm <sighs> sure she used to be like so proud to say my daughter's a lawyer she works in this building at this law firm 
but now she tells them her daughter's on YouTube too. Like that's a new added feature to it. So it's like my daughter's a lawyer and she's on YouTube. So she's oddly proud of it, I think, or she's just faking it and trying to make me feel good about it. <laughs> I don't know, but either way, she's amazing. Mm. No, it's like so interesting uh, because like, so, so it's so weird. So in the beginning, my parents like really judged me, but then now I think my dad even wants to like make his own YouTube channel because as no, no, it, it's like so funny. He's like an older version of me. He's, he's like, if I wouldn't even know how to explain it, but his, his goals, he wants to live to a hundred and maybe he wants to like go to Japan. Cause I know like there's a lot of people that live to a hundred, yep. like by Okinawa or whatever. Okinawa, yep. Yeah. So now he wants to like get into that. So who knows, maybe your mom might actually create a YouTube channel. Can you imagine if she did, what would it be about? My mom is a pianist, so I feel like hers would be about piano, but she's also, lately she's turned into a cat lady. A cat lady? So it lady? started six months ago. It started we were six never months cat ago. People. We were always dogs. <laughs> What's that? It started six months ago. That's when it I came. Know. It literally started six months ago. So she found a stray cat, so she took that cat in. And she was just supposed to be fostering it until it got adopted because my dogs are Yorkshire Terriers. They're not really, the cat's bigger than them. They don't really like cats so she was just supposed to foster it and then suddenly like this cat's never gonna leave it's a permanent part of our family and then she started going she found other stray cats so she started feeding them so now every day day and night she goes to feed all the stray cats in the neighborhood and she's taken in another one so now we have like the zoo at house at the house <laughs> with two dogs two cats and who knows how many more cats she's gonna add to it but yeah, she's become a cat lady. So her YouTube channel would probably be a mix of piano and all the cats that she's finding. That sounds like a really good niche. I don't think she yeah. would have much competitors. <laughs> what's what's like your uh, personal finance habits now? And is it different than when you were uh, being a lawyer? So, so you make this money from, you know, your company and as well as AdSense, right? Those are like your two streams. Or there's like multiple streams, like yeah, affiliate marketing? Yeah, company, plug in law. And then I have another legal company that's going to be launched soon. And then I have AdSense, sponsorships, and affiliates. Mm. Those are really the main ones. So then when it comes in, and it comes in like on whatever, like on a bi-weekly or monthly for AdSense, what do you do with that money? Like what percentage of that goes to paying the bills? What percentage goes to like index funds? What percentage just reinvest back into your business, how do you like divide that up every single month? So you know that uh, you're hitting your financial goals, goals as you continually grow. Yeah, I'm so a mix, right? Most of it is going to be reinvested. So I'm keeping the company money separate from my personal finances. Yeah. I'm not taking out from the company right now. So most of it's going to be reinvested. And I also open a solo 401k. So you can do that as the self-employed person. So I contribute to that. And for the most part, my living expenses are just through the savings that I had, the big emergency fund that I had before I left the law firm. Mm. And my big focus with the company is just growing. So mostly everything's going to get reinvested. Yeah. Cause I'm always curious. Cause like the way I do it, um, I'm like, cause I know I'm, so for example, right now I'm 26 and I'm still kind of like in this high risk, high reward part. So my entire mm -hmm. life, ever since I left dental school uh, would consist of me making like an obnoxious amount of money in a short amount of time. And then to retire for maybe like a couple months and <laughs> then, and then to see like an opportunity and to just then just lose a big chunk of money. And it's literally just been like that. Like, like I tried making finance videos because I was like, okay, yeah, let me let me teach people finance because you know the CPM rates are like high, and I'm like doing my research, and I'm like, oh, this isn't this isn't my core competency. I'm not like the freaking expert because I'm really good at making money, but yeah. it's just you know finding ways to balance it. That's why I asked you because it's literally like I can't tell you how many times like I would create an online business, uh, run Facebook ads to it, run YouTube ads to it, run Google ads to it make a bunch of money, uh, get really excited, then get lazy and stop doing it for some reason when I should have just started building a team, which is now what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like chill and relax, meditate, read spiritual books, um, go to events, uh, 
and stuff like that. Just go from like event to event to event network and then see a business opportunity kind of bite more than I could chew, lose a bunch of money. Then I'm like, Oh, what's the next idea? It's just like from there. And I was like, man, I wish I would have followed, you know, a YouTube channel like yours where I'm like, Oh, you know, I just need to put it in these buckets and stuff. Cause I know it, right? Like I read the, I read a bunch of stuff, but I think knowing it and applying it are two different things, especially if like, for example, a male in his mid twenties, want to accomplish a lot in a short amount of time. I think it's either for the ego or for whatever. And it, it's, just, you know, that very discipline like style of investing in personal finance and kind of like what you do. Um, so, so what would you recommend to somebody who's like high risk and high reward like me that needs to just chill oh. for a bit? You should definitely be maxing out your retirement account. Yeah. That's something I didn't do when I was 26 years old. I wish I would have. So if you don't have one, open up a solo 401k and just start trying to max that out. You can put around, don't quote me, but I think it's 53,000 this year, mm -hmm. 19,500 from your individual. And then as part of the company, the rest of it, I don't know if those numbers are, they might be slightly off, but focus on that. Just max out your solo 401k and then at least when you're spending the rest of it, you know that you've put aside a good chunk of it for your retirement or for yeah. your future. That's you, probably the best. You want to know like a funny story? So I was doing that, right? And I was like, okay. oh. and it was like good because, you know, I was just putting it in like a fund and I think I was using Betterment or something. And I was mm -hmm. just putting like a bunch of money in because uh, I would have the company money and then I would pay myself a salary. Um, and then from that salary, like I was living in Chiang Mai, Thailand and I was like, man, I'm only spending like $700 a month. It was ridiculous, right? $200 a month apartment. I was eating burritos every day for like $10 a month. And, and that was like by choice, right? Because I love like this uh, place in Thailand. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just a creature of habit. And, and I was putting everything. And this is, I think, something that most people shouldn't do and to learn from my mistake. So I was putting everything into this account and I was like, man, there's like, a good amount in here. Like I didn't even realize how much uh, was in here. I think there was like, I think 50 or 60 grand that saved up like pretty fast um, in the year. Right. When I, when I, when I started and I was like, man, yeah. like this is, this is amazing. Like I could, I could hit my goals and just have it all in an index fund and, you know, like diversification. And yeah. that's when the opportunity came. That's when like crypto happened and they're like, oh, wow, like we're making all this money. And I was just like, oh, how much money have I made from this account? And I was so stupid. I was just like, oh, let me just take everything out. <laughs> like it was so <laughs> stupid. I was like, let me just take everything out and like invest into all of like these cryptocurrencies. And oh, man, I was so stupid. I lost it all. But I, it was just like a really expensive mistake. Um but that, that's just like what I'm talking about. You know, I'll be very disciplined, but then I'll be very impatient because it's a very slow game compounding interest, right? Yeah. Um, and like part of my psychology is like, okay, let me just reinvest back in my business because I know I could create enough wealth in the next couple of years to then set me up for the rest of my life. But then there's like this thing where I'm just like, no, I want it sooner. And it usually just bites me in the ass like more times <laughs> than not. I mean, you realize the similarities, right? The the whole thing we're talking about, instant gratification for buying purses or buying these items to impress people. That's the thing with retirement funds too. It's not glamorous. It's not get rich quick. Yeah. It's literally the slow growth. But if you look at something like Warren Buffett's net worth, yeah. you can just Google it. There's charts of it. You see he has the slow growth. And then the power of compounding after he turns 50 is when he made the majority of his net worth because that's how compounding works right mm. so if you're 26 and taking out from your 401k already <laughs> you're not you're going to forever lose those compounding benefits for year 26 yeah so i know my advice i know is next i was time, an idiot first of all <laughs> forgive yourself for your mistakes everyone mis makes mistakes there's no point of dwelling on it but second like don't do that again <laughs> yeah i'll remember now <laughs> <laughs> now just put it in yeah. and think of it don't even think about that money 
for example, like in March, obviously we saw the market was very volatile. So a lot of people sold out. And the best thing you can do for your 401k, if you're someone like that who who doesn't necessarily like the slow growth, you're going to e hate it even more when you see your account down mm. 10, 20%. So just don't look at it. Once you put the money in the 401k, don't even think about it. Don't look at it. Check up on it like once a year. Mm. That's the kind of personality type you seem to be. So yeah. I would do that. I'm like that too. Like in in February, March, I couldn't look at my 401k because it was just too devastating. Yeah. So I didn't. And that's the way to do it because that's how you avoid making these quick decisions that will cost you. Mm. For your solo 401k, where, which uh, services or places do you go for that? I'm using Vanguard. Okay, Vanguard. A bunch of, there are so many good choices out there, but my preference is just Vanguard. So that's where I went. Yeah. And then, so you just like set up an account with them and then uh, you just auto deduct it every single month and it just goes in there. So you're not even looking at it. I just, I manually put it in, but auto deduction, I recommend. Yeah, no, I was like too aggressive. Like I was like seeing everything was in my Betterment account and it was just like going up and I was like, man, this is like crazy, but it's so slow. Like I, it, in, in that year, it was like a 10% growth and I was like, fuck, I only made five grand. This is so freaking slow. Like I could just put that in Facebook ads and make more. I know. So I think, I, know. I think you need both of them, right? You need to like your active income and then this thing that is just like, slowly building up uh are you are you then applying that in your business then you're, you're just gonna like pay yourself a salary and then treat that as if you're still working at a job and then diversify your salary into the buckets or are you gonna do the same thing with your business profits where you're not necessarily gonna pay yourself but then you're gonna diversify like what big companies do and invest through your company instead of being in, an investor and just like you, you know what I'm talking about? I, I know what you're talking about. I have to talk to my accountant because I can't, <laughs> this is my first year of self-employment. So I haven't yeah. quite figured out how I'm going to do that. I'm obviously going to pay myself enough so that I can max out the 401k from the individual standpoint. Yeah. But as far as what I'll do for the rest of it, I'm, I'm not the expert. My accountant is, so I just got to <laughs> Are you, are you <laughs> a, a U.S. citizen device. or are you a Japanese citizen? I'm both. Okay, so with taxes, then that means then you have to pay taxes to the U.S. because with, I think U.S. is like the only place where they basically own you and control you everywhere. Correct. <laughs> Man. Yes, I pay my U.S. taxes. I pay my Japan taxes. I pay taxes to everyone who wants my tax money. <laughs> no, there's actually ways. I was looking into it. There's actually ways where. Um, you can, can, especially when you're out of the U.S. for so long, like there's this uh, website called Nomad Capitalist. Capitalist, where, yeah. Yeah, where you're just kind of like planting you live your like flag. like less than 90 days in multiple different places. Wow. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his blog. Would you would you ever get into that or start doing that? Totally. Yeah? Like how would you, how would you see and paint, you know, the ultimate vision of your life? Like say, you know, you have, you know, 1 million in your index fund, 1 million in your uh, retirement account, 1 million in all these things. Now it's just time to like protect it all. You know, fast forward to in the future when you've actually, all of the things that you're doing right now are reaping the benefits. Like what would be kind of like your dream life in uh, the allocation or the asset allocation? And now instead of focusing on making money, it's it's more like keeping the money and not letting taxes uh really ruin your life like what would be that for you huh i <laughs> you're like i've never been asked these questions before <laughs> these are really good i don't know my would you just my buy dream, a bunch of cats I can talk for about my mom. dream lifestyle you could just buy a bunch of cats for your mom yeah i just i'm candles. afraid the irs is listening so i don't really yeah. want to <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> um Look, I think you have to be very, I think diversification is important for yeah. a reason. You have to have your very conservative investments. You have to have your cash. You have to have your index funds. You can have a few individual stocks that you've picked in companies that you really believe in. But in the aggregate, I think individual stocks are too risky for me, at least. So I prefer index funds for that reason. And you um, pay all that through Vanguard. 
the index I ones? use a bunch. I have Robinhood. I have Weeble. I have Vanguard. I have Fidelity. I'm kind is there of, a reason? I have everything. Is there a reason why you uh, go to different ones? Like, how do you diversify that? Like, say, for example, if you have a thousand dollars that you want to put into these accounts every single month, but you have like three or four, is there a reason why you put 200 here, 300 there, 400 there? So whatever, what I would do is you should always, the tax advantage accounts. So tax advantage, like the 401k, a Roth IRA, that should be where your money goes first, because that's really important. You're getting a tax benefit there. So it's really if you're putting $1,000, it's actually worth more than $1,000 because of the tax benefits you get. And then you can do it into normal brokerages that don't aren't aff- associated with these uh, tax advantage accounts. So for me, that's my play money. My play investment money goes to Webull. It goes to Robinhood. That's where it goes. But it has to trickle down, right? So mm. only after I max out my 401k and my Roth IRA should I really be putting money in my Weeble and my Robin Hood. Mm. And then your 401k and your Roth, that, that's the one that's all in Vanguard. Yep. 401k and Roth is all in Vanguard. From my previous company, that mm. 401k, I didn't choose to roll it over. So that's in Fidelity. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting so much ideas because I feel like uh, my character of just, you know, making money and losing a bunch of money is, is, can, can go through this interesting story where now I feel like, man, maybe my YouTube channel should just be me getting financial advice, but it's almost like the comedic relief of all of like the bad decisions that I've made. <laughs> and then someone like you just be like, no, no, it's okay. Just forgive yourself. Practice self-love. You know, my, my mom will p- play you a song from her piano yeah. and you get to like pet the cat. I'm thinking like, maybe that's what I do. Just like authentically share all of my mistakes and have experts like you come in and be like, okay, this is what you do. There's listen, kid, right? Even though you're 26 and I thought you were like in your mid twenties, but then you said back when I was 26, I'm like, man, how old is she? I like to act like an old soul. You look very (laughs) young though. I think you're going to stay like that for like a long time, you know? Fingers crossed. But I think Asians are, are, are different because there's like a period of our life where like we'll look good and then in in a span of a month, we'll just just like disintegrate and we'll look like, you, you ever realize that? Like Asian people, we look good and then there's just a period where it just hits us hard, you know? Oh no. Do you know what age that's at? I think Jap- Japan, you guys have a lot longer than uh, Filipinos, like J- Japanese people look a lot younger. Okay. Yeah, but I think- crossed on that too. I don't know. <laughs> where, where do you get your financial advice from? Oh, Reddit was a big source for me. (laughs) I know it's not the best. Reddit, Reddit, Notre Dame, Reddit, Notre Dame. (laughs) Which one's more valuable to you, Reddit or your Notre Dame alumni? That's so funny. I don't know. I spent so much, so much time at Notre Dame. I feel like I ought to say Notre Dame. (laughs) Plus, all the fighting Irish will be mad at me if I say Reddit's more valuable. Yeah. But that's, I mean, we're in an information age. Anything you want to learn, you can find it online. So really, a lot of the learning I do is like, for example, there's this thing called a backdoor Roth IRA, where if you're above the income limits for a Roth IRA, most people think you can't actually use the Roth IRA. Like you're probably above the income limits for a Roth IRA. So you probably think you can't use it. But there's a process called the backdoor Roth IRA where even if you're above the income limits, it doesn't matter. You can actually deposit the money into a traditional IRA and then switch it over to Roth IRA. And therefore you end up with the Roth IRA benefits. Mm. So things like that, when I hear about them, then I'll just dig into it and research it a lot. Mm. So really, I don't have like one source for financial information. I'm just digging hard into things that I find that are interesting. Mm. With the use of my friend Google.com. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you then focusing on more now? Uh, your website, Plug in Law, or your YouTube channel, or or both? Are you balancing them? Because you're also starting a third company. Yeah. Where, where's like your main focus going to be in the next 12 months? The next 12 months are going to be my legal businesses because that's where I really think the impact is, that's where the need in the market is. YouTube is 
very fun for me, mm. but um, I don't ever see myself as just YouTube full time. That's not really yeah. my goal with it. So YouTube is very important to me. And right now um, I do multiple videos a week, maybe three or four or five. So that's been taking up a lot of time. So I've had to put some of the legal stuff on the back burner, mm. but eventually the gears should shift so that YouTube will go back to one video a week. That way I can manage to uh, spend time on my legal businesses. Mm. And uh, with that, cause, cause now you're, you said this is your first time self-employed. What, what would you say your biggest challenges are when it comes to building the legal side of your business. Cause that's exactly what happened to me. I just focused all on YouTube. And there was a time where I actually had to put YouTube on the back burner and literally people thought I died cause I didn't make videos for like months. And then out of nowhere, I'm just like, I'm back motherfuckers. Yeah. Um, and then it was just cause like I focused all in on business because th th there comes a point where you realize that when you make videos, when you don't want to, just cause you feel like this is how you're going to make money. It just feels like another job. And I didn't yeah. want that. So I wanted to build systems and like run ads more in to sales funnels so that I could find clients and customers come to me instead of just making videos all the time. Uh, but for you, when you make that switch and instead of 80% YouTube, 20% legal business, mm -hmm. you do 20% YouTube and 80% legal business. What do you think your biggest challenges are going to be when it comes to moving down in that area? Yeah, I think the hardest thing for anyone that has this entrepreneurial mind is not getting pulled in a thousand different directions. Because if you're trying to do a thousand things, you're going to get zero things done, right? Mm. So even with the legal business, it's like you mentioned Pinterest before. So it's like, should I use Pinterest and learn how to do Pinterest? Should I use Instagram? Should I start running Google ads? And it's very hard to get pulled in multiple directions, especially like a year ago today, I was a corporate lawyer, just like yeah. sitting at my office. This is all a new world to me. So there are a lot of, there's a huge learning curve. There's a very steep learning curve that I'm having to figure all of this out on my own. So I think my biggest weakness right now is getting pulled in multiple directions. Plus YouTube just takes forever. Like people don't, you know this, yeah. I know this, but people don't realize that a 10 minute video that you see takes eight to 15 hours to create. So my big thing is going to be focus and really working on this legal business because my whole goal with this year was always to build passive income. Mm -hmm. And one of the realizations that I've had is that YouTube is not necessarily passive income. There's an element of it that's passive. But if I disappear for three months, my YouTube ad revenue is going to be like a dollar a day, right? Yeah. So it's not that passive. Whereas the legal business I'm creating, I'm creating it strategically in a way that it would actually be passive. I mm. could leave for three months and have my team deal with most matters and it would actually be passive. So I want to focus more time on that because mm. as exciting as YouTube is, it's, it's not as passive as I thought it would be. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, you, it, you, like, it feels like it's passive, right? Like there's months where, you know, I'll be like, wow, this is insane. You know, this is like the best thing ever. But then, you know, you do it a little bit too much. You're like, oh man, now I feel insignificant because my views are lower and the ad sense is down and it sucks, right? Because it, 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 it turns into this, um, little like dopamine hit every single time it hits and you're like, oh man, it didn't get as much views as the previous one. I'm worthless and stuff like that. Uh, but with your legal business, what, what's, what's kind of like your strategy, what would be the product? And then how is the delivery and what are the people in your team that you have, or you don't have that you actually need for this to actually happen so that you could leave and get that creative income or that, that passive income. For sure. That's a really good question. Okay. The things that I have, so the primary aspect of plugin law is it's legal templates. So yeah. it's a privacy policy for your website. It's terms and conditions for your website. And it's a disclaimer for your website. So you basically plug in the information that you need for your website. You plug in your URL, but yeah. then it spits out a very customized contract for you using the software that I have. Right. So that's the primary thing. So that's something that can be completely automated. I don't really need to be a part of it because I've already spent the hours drafting it. And all you have to do 
as the customer is answer a few questions. So mm -hmm. eventually I want a whole lineup where every single document you can imagine, if you need um, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, you can come to plug in law and get that. If you need anything for your business mm -hmm. and don't want to just use the free, not great versions, you can just come get them for a fraction of the cost and use or and get a very very high quality document for your business um and i think the team members that i would need i definitely need some more legal experts helping me <laughs> because in terms of content creation i mean for seo you know that one of the most important things is these blog posts yeah and i haven't necessarily found the time to create the blog posts about what is a privacy policy what is ccpa what is gdpr so I would need legal experts to help me with that and content creation. But then pretty much everything else can be automated. Mm. And then where are you planning on getting your clients? My clients, eventually I'm going to be doing ads, but yeah. my clients thus far have come organically. And then also I have a free legal guide that walks you through as an online business owner, what you need. So that's been my lead magnet and that's gotten a lot of clients mm. or customers. It's actually interesting that you uh, said that because a couple of months ago, um, cause, cause my sister and my cousin, they, they like run this agency. Right. And I was like, Oh, can you just like make me famous on Pinterest or whatever? Because I just don't want to depend on YouTube. That was like my biggest stick with YouTube is I felt like I was always having to depend on it. Right. And I felt like that I always needed that there. And it was really hard because I wanted to focus on these things, but everything was just like, go back and make YouTube videos, go back. The views will feel good. It'll feel good. You'll make AdSense revenue. It's going to be cool. Um, but, but there was like this need of same way how we need to diversify um, our investments. It's also good to diversify traffic, right? Because for yeah. example, like the reason why I started YouTube in the beginning was because my Facebook ad account got downed and mm -hmm. just like it stopped. So I couldn't run ads. So I was like, man, how am I going to find it? So I literally created YouTube as just another traffic source. But then I stopped doing what I did in the past. And that's finding new sources um, and doing it in a way where I don't go crazy. So one of our biggest focuses uh, was to like streamline everything. And I don't know, maybe this could help you out uh in your process because i would love to like you've helped me so much not be like an idiot with my money and i'm just gonna re-listen to this and meditate <laughs> to this um but what we did is i remember it all stemmed actually from youtube and you could actually have everything come from that youtube video um as long as you have like an intention with it i remember i made a youtube video and then because it's so much easier to research and to just say it and then you have someone write out what exactly what you said, but then you get it on Pinterest. And then once you rank, it's actually very cheap to run ads to it. Um, and, oh. and that's, that's one thing, instead of running ads to the people, you run ads to the people that have already consumed your content. And it's so crazy that you said your business model, because while I was on Pinterest, um, reverse engineering some things, cause now like I think our Pinterest gets like 150,000 impressions a month or something oh like gosh. that. Yeah. I'm like, Angela, what are you doing um, <laughs> with there? She's like, oh, you know, I threw away all your like old content and I made you look all, you know, aesthetic. And I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> keep on doing whatever you're doing. I, I was actually seeing some people that were in the same business as you selling legal templates. And, and it's actually really interesting because I feel like that's, that's like an easy win for you where like, there was only one competitor and she's been doing it. So like, I know she's making money from it. Mm -hmm. And the moment I just clicked on her website and clicked on her, um, her thing for legal templates, it was just like one blog post, right? So you don't actually have to make thousands of blog posts. You just need to, I think if I could find that blog, blog article, I could send it to you. So you could even like yeah. reverse engineer it for you. <laughs> So I clicked on that and then once I clicked on it, they're like uh, running Facebook ads, like me understanding, I know that she's not spending that much, but it may seem like it cause she's like, like everywhere. Mm -hmm. But once I clicked on it, she probably spends like five or $10 a day. 
And since I showed intent that I clicked on it, like I just see her ads now everywhere because I touched her website and she knows that I want legal templates. So everywhere is just like, this is like why you need legal templates is why. And I'm like, man, I, I don't, I don't even want legal templates. I just wanted to like reverse engineer your sales funnel. But I think that's something that you could kill it in, right? Like I would just need to find that article. You just make that one article. Um, the, the Pinterest thing, you just get so much free traffic and it's free, right? It's not expensive. Yeah. And then if you're going to spend money on ads, it's going to be something as small as like five or $10 a day. Um, just retargeting people that have seen that blog article. That's brilliant. <laughs> I think you should do it. I think you would kill it. And, and I think you're, you're cooler than this person that I like saw. Right. So I think, I think you would actually that be really because well. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I say this to everyone. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll have to write that down. I'll yeah. do that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And if there's any way that I think we could help your, not, not even me. Cause I, like, I don't even have, I don't have like the attention span and you're smarter than me. I could even like connect you with my sister if that's something that you would need help with because yeah, I, I did I meet you sister. because of her. <laughs> yeah, I totally want to meet her. <laughs> cool. That's amazing. So that being said, um, with finance advice, what would be like the top five tips that you would now give to someone like me who who's very impatient but needs financial advice okay seeing, top five yeah just seeing like how i am for this past hour or so okay for you <laughs> you should be contributing to your retirement accounts but then don't look at them mm. just contribute once you contribute don't even think of it as money you own it's gone you don't get to see it until you're retired number two um probably come up with a system where you know where every dollar goes. So when you make a thousand dollars in your business, understand and know where every single dollar of that thousand dollar goes, whether it's into your retirement account or your emergency fund or to pay yourself and go out for a nice ice cream, whatever it is, like know where every dollar goes and have a job for every dollar. I think there's a book about that, but I haven't mm. read it. Um, <laughs> number three, Remember that you're young and even though you've made financial mistakes in the past, just let go of it because I think too many people get caught up in the mistakes they've made and feel bad about it. Just let it go. They were lessons learned. Now you know to be a little smarter about crypto. <laughs> number four, number four, you're young and you're killing it. Like you're doing such an amazing job in the online world. I've realized just in this year, how much potential there is in the online world for money making. Mm. So just keep doing what you're doing in that sense and really, really try to do something that you enjoy as well. Because I think part of it is if you're doing these bursts of energy where you're working on your business and then taking a break for a long time, maybe you haven't found that thing yet that makes you feel very passionate about it. Mm. Because I think once you find something that you're very passionate about it, you're not going to want to take these like, spurts of energy and then drops mm. you're gonna just love it so much that you're gonna keep doing it so i keep searching for that thing because i think tied to tied to making money is also you want to feel like you're having an impact and you're already having a huge impact on people with your online businesses but just keep going at that and find that thing that is like you're meant to do that because mm. you'll make a lot of money doing that like money comes with passion right yeah they always say I follow your passions and the money follows something like that. So number five, I think keep doing what you're doing in terms of living outside of the U S I think people, people like us realize it, but people in the U S don't realize that you can just live a very nice life with low expenses. If you are able to venture outside of the comfort zone of mm. Chicago or wherever it is for you. Right. So a lot, half of it was like change, change what you're doing. Half of it was like, you're doing things great and don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, I actually want to thank you because this was actually one of the first things for me to then just go back into that realm, right? I think one of the things that I'm really passionate about is when I'm able to just openly admit my mistakes instead of putting like the guru hat on. 
yeah. and to just authentically talk to someone. And it was actually really cool because with everything in the business that's going on and just all of like our audience completely shifting from 18 to 24 year old males to 18 to 54 year old women that are either starting a business or have a, a successful business. It's just been really daunting to, and over, over, like a little bit overwhelming to be like, oh man, I hope I could continually give value to these women that are just something that I'm not used to creating videos for. Right. So I just want to say thank you because like you were the first one that we were kind of like testing with to see like, okay, what if we just have a conversation with, with a woman that's killing it and we could use that to just like empower other women. And maybe if they need legal advice or personal finance advice, they could just, you know, kind of like get connected. And it was something that was really inspired when my sister was like, yo, you need to just like start talking to all these cool women instead of everyone else. And like, I'm just so grateful for you to, for hopping on and getting on this podcast. And if there's anything that you ever need, or if there's any way that I could add value to you, um, I would love to help out in any way. Oh, thank you. That was really nice of you. And same, I'm going to hook you up with the legal stuff so that you're legally protected. So don't even worry about it. You can ignore those ads that you're getting. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, same. Honestly, it's it's so fun to talk about finance because I feel like people don't talk about money enough. Mm. And you obviously do a great job talking about the make money aspect. And that's so important too. I feel like the more vulnerable I am about talking about money, the more it's going to help other women because we're really holding ourselves back mm. by not talking about it, not having conversations about how much you're making, how to negotiate a salary raise, mm. how to save money, how not to buy purses every day. <laughs> like All of these things are very important to just have a transparent disclosure discussion about, right? So mm. it's it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Yeah, no. And, and I think that's one thing that stops people the most because everyone sees where they're at and they see where everyone else is like at successfully and there's no like middle ground. So yeah. it, it's constantly a losing battle because people are comparing their insides to people that are already killing it when, for example, they weren't there when you were, you know, busting your ass off paying nine or $10,000 a month to your uh, student loans and um, really getting that situated. Like, I think that's the hardest thing with pers uh, personal finance advice is as you get more and more successful, you get more and more unrelatable. And it just makes yeah. uh, women in this case more overwhelmed and be like, oh, that can never be me. I'm not, I can't do what Erica did. She's like making all these videos and stuff like that. And, and it, it's kind of like that thing where what you said, we need to start having these authentic conversations where people need to know that we don't actually know everything. We're figuring things out on our own, but that shouldn't stop you from actually putting your foot in because if you're overwhelmed and you're comparing, you know, where you're at right now to where they're at, they're, they're already going to be in a losing battle because they haven't seen all the hardships that you went through, you know? Yeah, no, I think so. And I think like a lot of this online space, um, because again, like a year ago, I had no idea who any of these online people were and. I think something I've realized about this online space is it's a lot, it's much of it is ego driven, right? Yeah. People only want to talk about their success. They only want to broadcast. I make three thousand, ten thousand $10,000 a month. Once they've gotten there, no one really talks about, Oh, I made $50 this month. Yeah. And when I first started out, I started from zero, right? So in January, I made this video talking about how I wanted to build $200,000 of passive income. And all of my income streams, they were at zero. So it's very important, I think, for people like us who have somewhat of a, well, I have somewhat of a platform, you have a big platform, but for people to be more vulnerable and transparent yeah. about the starting point, because it get, it paints a very unrealistic view of making money or all of this of success when you only hear from the people who have already made it. Like, I don't think I've made it by any means i think i'm still like when i do my passive income updates i think the last one of the last ones i did was in march and you know so in january i did this thing where it was like i've made zero dollars and i was so excited because i was like i'm gonna kill it like the next one's the next update is gonna be in march i'm gonna really blow impress people and when it came to march 
I had only made like a thousand five hundred dollars. And when you divided all of the hours that I put mm. into making these online businesses, I was making like 58 cents an hour. Mm. And that's really important, I think, to show the growth because then it makes you more relatable, right? Because mm. I'm not some I'm not some millionaire who has killed it with all of my businesses. I'm not like, I'm just barely starting and crawling my way up for YouTube. I had 2000 subscribers a couple of months ago and mm. I was still going at it. It just, in those 30 days, I went from 2000 to 50,000. So everyone thinks I'm like this semi big YouTube channel now, but I'm not like I, I was just at 2000 subscribers. I wasn't even monetized. So mm. it's very important to talk about, the the growth and to say like hey i don't have everything figured out because otherwise it's discouraging like it it's mm. it's not relatable when i listen to podcasts and this person's talking about how they've made a million dollars this year because i'm not anywhere close to that so yeah i think the more people like you and i can be open and transparent and vulnerable and not let our egos drive us because my ego says that i only want to talk about my success once yeah. i've reached it but that's not how things should work, right? We should talk about it as we're growing because that's the only way people are going to see that it's actually a slow growth process. Mm. And that's also, sorry, one more thing. There's this problem in the online space called the get rich quick scheme. And everyone thinks there's a get rich quick scheme. So they fall prey to all of these $2,000 courses. And the reason there's a problem like that is because the people who, I don't know, had some success drop shipping or whatever, they only talk about, the highlights of it right they only yeah. talk about first of all how much revenue they made they don't talk about the expenses and they only talk about it once they've had success so there's this distorted perception of how you can make money online mm. and i think the more people like us come and say like it's not that easy it's a slow growth process the better it'll be in the mm. in the long run so i'm actually glad that you said that because that was actually uh where i came from um one of my first uh, big monies was actually drop shipping, and mm -hmm. I was always so afraid, like so afraid to talk about like the up and going because I was like, oh, you know, they're gonna judge me, um, or what if I fail? That was like a big thing. What if I put everything out there and I actually fail and I look like an idiot, right? Um, and like I, I became successful with drop shipping, uh, but then. I think because of greed or because of just seeing so much opportunity, that's when I was like, okay, let me just try selling how easy it is to drop ship, right? So there was like a good period of time where I was just selling courses about that. But one of the things that I realized and in, in why I learned from that and why I don't sell any more of my own courses, like at all, right? Like I only recommend uh, my mentor's course and that's just because he's not he's not a product seller. He's a course creator, right? So he runs like a big agency. They do like a million dollars a month. It's like ridiculous. And he's the one that focuses on the product. And I just mm -hmm. focus on the marketing. But I remember in the beginning, I was always so just confused on why whenever I would get people to buy these products, you know, even though someone gets successful, there was actually so many people that didn't, right? And I yeah. wanted to look into it. I was like, well, why is this different? You know, I'm literally giving them exactly what I did, but how come I was able to make it happen? These people are able to make it happen, but most people have this weird expectation on what actually needs to be put in to actually build a business. Like some yeah. people would come in and be like, oh, I spent $10 on advertising. It doesn't work. It's a scam. And I'm like, why, why am I attracting these people? And then I realized it, it wasn't these people's fault. It was of the content that I was creating and you attract what you create. You attract yeah. more of who you are. And I think the reason why I stopped is because I, I looked in the mirror and I was like, fuck, it, it's not that these people are failing. It's just who I am trying to be this persona that I'm trying to create of a successful entrepreneur that never fails in his life. And if I could do it, you could do it too. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do it. It attracted people that I felt like didn't actually want to work on themselves or that weren't okay with having like the hard conversation. So like, like when you said that, I felt like a little bit weird. Cause I was like, man, like she's going to know that I was one of those get rich quick schemer person. I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> no, no. But, but I'm actually glad that you said that because, you know, I'm so glad that I made that switch in position. Cause what I realized it was so funny. I was making like five and 10 minute videos. 
right? And everyone's like, this is great. Like I got the hack and this is crazy. I could get like one of my biggest videos I think has like 2 million views. I have two videos that are 2 million views, right? Like one of them was like three ways to make a hundred dollars a day as a broke individual. Um, and whatnot. And it like came in, everyone came in, I wasn't selling a course. It was like one of the things that like started building the channel. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was just so weird when I started making longer videos and this is what, when it comes in terms of creating things, I think for what you think the world needs versus what you, the world thinks they need in this case, because had I've created videos for this get rich quick mentality, like it would have been like this, like validation hit where the views are high when I make these videos, but I make these videos that actually help people and the video, the views are a lot lower. And I, I remember I went from like a five minute video or like a 10 minute video clip to like 30 minutes and like, it's too long, make it shorter. And then I did like an hour, like it's too long. And I'm like, man, like the views started dropping. But then I realized it's because all of those people that I was originally attracted to, to like that get rich quickness, I started repelling them because when I'm making like a 40 minute video, they're like, oh. This is like like 30 minutes too long. I need I need like a million dollars in the next five minutes. This isn't going to cut it. I'm just going to skip it. Which which we don't realize that the people viewing our videos are, are people. And it's like, who are we attracting? You know, like with yours, the reason why I got you on is I know you're attracting like higher level people because you just put higher level content that you're not really too focused on jumping into the bandwagon of just making videos to track people that are like on a lower frequency. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, the, I'm so, first of all, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I did not. Like, no, no, I'm no. Not it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm perfectly fine I'm with so it. Embarrassed. That, that's when I was like younger. I'm a lot. That's I'm when mortified. I, <laughs> um, but it is true. Like it's, so one example for my channel yeah. is I have this video about how I paid off the student loans, right? It's like the four ways that I paid off my $200,000 of student loans. And sometimes I'll get these people who watch the video and they realize there's no secret. Like there's no big <laughs> secret for how I you did it. And they start getting mad at me. They're like, this was useless. This was a useless video, had no secrets. Or like, of course you paid it off. You're a lawyer. And they start getting mad at me that I don't have like some secret because the secret to paying off loans is you have to spend more than you make and then take that and put it towards your loans. Like there's, there's no secret, but they get mad at me for some reason that I had the audacity to create a video and not give them a secret. And that's, that's the mentality, right? Like the people you're so right. The people who want to watch those get rich quick videos aren't the people who are actually going to get rich because the people who are going to get rich realize that there's no, there's no such thing as mm. get rich quick and you have to do it slowly. And it's just a progress, right? It's a ladder. And the people who are investing time watching those five minute videos about how to make a hundred dollars a day, aren't the people who mm. are actually willing to invest and put the time into learning about actual personal finance and realizing that it's like, it's a 30 year process, not yeah. a one day process. And you probably, that's probably the same thing with your course. The people who purchased your course, they thought it was the secret to getting rich quickly. And then when they realized they had to put actual work into it and actual thought into it, those weren't the right clientele. Right. And that's yeah. why if, a thousand people take your course, maybe only 10 people found success because those 10 people are the ones who were actually willing to put the work into it and take your advice and use every piece of it instead of looking for some secret, which there is not. Mm. So it's nothing on you. Like you, I'm sure you had a great course. Mm. <laughs> Just the people expectations it was, are it was, different, it was right? more, it was more on like the marketing of it. Right. That's why I think everything I'm like switching. I'm like, okay, instead of shorter videos, what if I just made longer videos, right? Because if someone's going to listen to an hour and 17 minutes, they're, they're, they're probably going to be, they're, they're probably somebody that has a business that like want legal templates, right? Like that wouldn't really make sense to someone, oh, I want to make a hundred dollars a day. Like they, they're not even focusing on the bigger picture, right? So 
Yeah, no, I'm fine. I didn't take offense. Like, I, th- I thought it was actually hum- I thought it was humorous because I was like, wow, this is hilarious, right? Because I think it just shows, like, even right now, like, in my old mind, had that have happened, I would have felt scared and wanted to close up. Like, oh, yeah, screw those get rich quick people. Yeah, those <laughs> assholes. Yeah, you know, I would never do that. But but I don't know. I just feel like it, it just shows that I guess I'm growing <laughs> or maturing in some way. But I want to. I love it. I love it. I'm gonna say, uh, like, I usually keep these under like an hour and thirty minutes. I just want to say thank you for hopping on. This was actually really fun. You know, I felt like I really got to know you and your mom in this <laughs> in this podcast. I hope she doesn't listen to this. I'm not gonna. I'll share this with everyone else, and I'm not gonna share it with my she's mom. Gonna, she's gonna play it, and you're gonna think she's watching, but she's like, no, you know. I'm giving her a Filipino accent because that's only Asian. <laughs> she's like, no, 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 it's okay. You know, just add revenue for you, darling. I know she's just gonna play it in the background. Yeah, and I'll come downstairs and like hear my voice. <laughs> mm. Does she do it in like two x speed? Yeah, she does. Really? Yeah. Man, so that must feel. Weird, like, and you're like yeah, I know. What are you doing? It feels like she's cheating me. Like I work so hard on these videos, and she doesn't even watch them. She just puts them on low, low volume in the background <laughs> <laughs> and two X. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, if there's anything that I could do for you, let me know. I think we're connected on email. But yeah, that was like a really dope podcast. You know, I'm so glad that Yay. I started doing these again. I'm not good at these. This really? is my like third podcast in my life. So <laughs> no, I think it's a really good medium because number one, content becomes easier. Um, like there's so much clips of here of you just authentically saying like really good advice. Um, number two, you don't feel like you're just talking to a camera. Like sometimes when I'm talking to camera and it's not you, like the camera's like right here. I'm like, okay, turn it on. <laughs> Hey guys, this is the three C. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> fuck. Okay, record. Just, you know, it's like annoying. <laughs> like here, there's no going back. Like if, if I make a mistake, I have to, I can't be like, hey, excuse me, can we just redo that again? I, I know. Just, you know? No, I like this. I It's refreshing. You're like my social interaction for the day. So I've checked that off. <laughs> now I can go talk to my camera for the rest of the day. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Ready for this? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anything you need, uh, just let me know. Yeah. Same to you. This okay. was fun. Do you have any questions, by the way, before I end this? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> it was nice talking to you, Erica. Good talking to you, Mike. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye.